we continue looking at a few words that are essential for us to use, the Christianese, so to speak, the words we toss around but need to make sure we, we understand. And I could define words, or I could tell you a story. And I know which one you'd rather have, so let me tell you the story of Ruth. Elimelech was a farmer who lived in the Wild West of Scripture. In the time between uh, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt and, and the beginning of the kingdom under uh, David and Solomon and the rest, there's this time in between that's the time of Judges, is what it's called. It's in the book of Judges, and it is a wild time. And in the middle of that time, a famine hits, and a farmer named Elimelech gets hard up, and he has to sell the family farm. And so he sells the farm, and still can't make it as a day laborer, and so he takes his wife and his two kids, and they go to Moab. Uh, Moab is not exactly what you'd expect to hear them where they'd be going. It's not a, a friendly neighboring country, but it's where they can find to go, and they're desperate. So that's where they go. They get there, and they get settled, and Elimelech dies. We don't know why, but it happens. Elimelech has died, and, and his uh, widow, Naomi, now has a problem. She is a foreigner, and she's got these two sons. And she needs to find those two sons some wives pronto. And it's a challenge because usually it's the husband who does all the negotiation, dowry, marriage is far more of a business contract then. And, uh, but she's, and she's a foreigner, so she's not from around here, she doesn't have a lot of money to offer, but she is able to find two, two families that will marry, out, marry off their daughters to her sons. And so she gets her two sons, both have brides. And then over the next year, next 10 years, they proceed to have zero children and they need they need kids like if you're going to farm land you no tractors what do you need you need more hands you need kids right so they're they're trying to have kids can't have kids trying to have kids can't have kids this is bad right and then after 10 years her two sons they die again we don't know why did they die at the same time did they die at the same year I, we don't know so this is an ugly situation. We have a widow in a foreign land, and she has her two daughter-in-laws, daughter and that's it. No land, no, no, no one to earn their keep. They, they, oh, it's bad. And so she figures if she's down and out, she might as well be down, out, down and out back where she's a bit more comfortable. And so she starts to go back, go back to Israel. And she starts to head out, and her two daughter-in-laws come with, because that's her family, their family now. Like, they left the their parents' house, and now their family is, is Naomi. And at, they start walking, and then she realizes what she's about to do to them. Because she has gone to the foreign land, and now she's taking those two women, and they're going to be foreigners where they're headed. And so she has this moment of, of grace towards them. Like, I will act for your good, even though it makes my life harder. He, she looks at her two daughters-in-law and says, you go home. I release you. And, they, and she has to tell them this or else they can't go. Like, I release you. You can go. Go back to your parents' house. Maybe they find your husband. Maybe they don't. But they'll be able to feed you. And I can't promise you that right now. And one of them, Orpah, says, okay, you make a good argument. I'll miss you. They cry, they hug, she goes. And Ruth, Ruth is stubborn. And she does something gutsy. She responds to Naomi's concern to her, for her, with concern in return. She says, you are concerned for me. I am concerned for you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Here we go. And they go, and they go back to Israel, and they, they go back to the hometown, and uh, now they gotta make some, they gotta get some food. So, Naomi knows how it's supposed to work. When you harvest your field, you're supposed to leave the corners so that anyone who's willing to get off their duff and work can eat. And so, Ruth, in theory, should be able to go out there in the barley har harvest. They show up right when the barley har harvest is about to begin. So Ruth should be able to go out there and work and get uh, some food. 
The question is, when it says in Scripture, one of the 613 teachings of Torah, to leave the corners of your field unharvested, how big's your corner? Right? If you can imagine how this works, you can follow the letter of the law and leave itty bitty little corner, and you really haven't followed the spirit of the law. And so the way it had evolved at this point was, instead of leaving an actual corner unharvested, what they would do is, the way you'd harvest any of the grains, barley and then wheat, is you'd go through and you'd scythe it down and you'd let it lie in the field for a day or two so that it could dry a bit and then you'd go back and you'd bundle it up and then you'd go and thresh it. And so after the workers had gone through once to cut it, twice to bundle it, anything they missed was fair game. And so it became a matter of really not how big your corners are, but how hard you push your workers to be thorough. Because if you were really thorough, you could say, yeah, any, you can go pick up anything I missed, and I didn't miss anything, right? And so it's kind of a risky situation. Because you don't know if there's going to be anything in the field to pick up, and you can't tell till you go and try. And so Ruth goes out there, and she's going to try to do it. She's going to try to go out there and, and find some leftover grain. So she goes, and she goes out, again, this is... Ruth is just amazing, so gutsy. And she goes out and, and she finds a field to try and, and she, she is working in this field. And, and the field is the field of a farmer by the name of Boaz. And Boaz notices that this woman is, is working the field in the area they, they've gone over and notices that she's really hustling and says, bring her over. She's working, I want to, I want to meet her. And, and finds out that she is the daughter-in-law of Elimelech. And uh, Elimelech, he, Boaz knows him. They're family, they're cousins. You know how anyone who you're kind of related to, but you're not, not sure how? Oh, they're cousins, right? They're cousins. So Elimelech and, and uh, Boaz are cousins, and, and here is Ruth, who's taking care of uh, Elimelech's widow. Great. And, and so Boaz tells Ruth, take care, you, you're taking care of your mother-in-law, that, that's great. Drink with my workers, and, and you just go to it. Whenever you take as much time as you want, get yourself some grain. And so Ruth asks a favor at this point, because the way it works is the, the, the farmer, the workers, they go across the field in a line, and, and then you, she could come up behind and get what they missed, missed. What Ruth asks is, can I get in the line? I don't want to be back here grabbing the itty bitty stuff. Can I get in the line and can I work? So it, this is the spirit of the law, right? If you work, you should be able to eat. And so that's, Boaz has to be taken aback. But he says, okay, if you're work, you, you can eat. Get in the line, go for it. And after a day, she gathers uh, the barley that she's, put, she's harvested, and she threshes it herself, which is the process of getting the hole and, and the, uh, getting it so it's just the grain. And she brings home 30 pounds of barley. 30 pounds gathered by hand is pretty impressive. Usually when you're out gleaning and trying to just grab what you can from a field, you could get maybe one or two pounds a day. And so you got to imagine Naomi at home, she's sitting there worried for her foreigner daughter-in-law who's never been in Israel before and has, now has walked out into the fields into the realm where all the men are working. And she, this is a risky situation. And, and is she going to come back? Is she going to be assaulted? Is she going to be taken advantage of? How's this going to work? And she comes back with not two pounds of barley, but 30. She comes back with half a month's wages, basically. Like, this is really amazing on Ruth's part. She's working. So, uh, Naomi asks, huh? And Ruth is able to say, well, I'm working in the field of Boaz. And Elimelech goes, oh, Boaz. He's family. He actually says something more than he's family. He, he, she uses a term, goel. The goel in a family is the patriarch who is responsible for making it right when things go off the rails. Like... The Goel, let, let's say that the Schweder family farm, all the Kellers, all, this just went off the rails right now. In Casey, you lost the farm, right? 
Who do you turn to to make it right? Because, man, I need, I need a few bucks. Who's you? No? <laughs> Not him, because that's, his, that's your father-in-law. You turn to your dad, right? You're off the hook. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> And you're off the hook for her, too, because she would turn to Jim, her father-in-law, right? And so you go to your dad, because when she married you, she left her family, and she now no longer has a claim on you, Bob. Aren't you lucky? That's not how it works anymore, I know. Uh, <laughs> but the patriarch is the one, and if we still do this, right? If, the, if something goes off the rails, you go to your dad and say, you know what, help! And back when Elimelech lost the farm, the Goel, the patriarch, if he had been able to buy the farm back, he would have. But when a famine hits, it hits everyone, right? And so he couldn't do it. But here we are now, a decade and so later, the, the famine has, has passed. And now we're at the point where um, uh, Boaz is the Goel, the, the redeemer, for this chunk of the family, for Elimelech and, Elimelech and, and Naomi, and, and by extension Ruth. And so Naomi says, man, this is great. You go and you hang out with Boaz every day. He's family. And that's what she does. She goes and she hangs out every day, and uh, she works for two months. She works the entire barley harvest and the entire wheat harvest. And, and, that's, and she has enough to eat, and, and this is a good thing. Now, the harvest is done. Here's the turning point in the story. Because at this point, Ruth and Naomi, they've eaten for two months, but after you're done harvesting, that's it. Like, you, you're going to live off the harvest. And Ruth and Naomi now no longer have a way to uh, keep on getting food and eat. And so Ruth and Naomi come up with a plan. Naomi tells Ruth... Get dressed up. Remind them you're a woman. Right? Get dressed up. And on the last night, when all the harvest is in, all the threshing is done, the grain is all... Everyone's been paid off with their portion of grain, and everyone's had... The, their, I assume you, you, you get done with the harvest. You have a, It's like the last day of school. You go have a really big steak somewhere, right? You have, you have a really good meal. And when everyone is, is, is fat and sassy and asleep, you go in and you uncover Boaz's feet, right, and slip under his blanket. Now the word feet in Hebrew refers to anything below the waist. So, if you think about this, if someone curled up and slept at your feet, like if I'm, I'm sleeping here and you, you slept over here, I wouldn't wake up, would I? Would I right? I'd be kind of wigged out if I, I woke up in the morning and someone's sleeping on my floor, but I wouldn't wake up. Boaz wakes up. So the fact that Boaz wakes up means that when she uncovers his feet, well, basically, Naomi has told Ruth to go spoon. Right? Go cuddle with him. Right? Go cuddle and see what happens. Whenever he says, you say yes. Come back, Mrs. Boaz. The, the, kind of the subtext there. Right? Because what Naomi says is, I need to make sure you're taken care of. And if you come back, Mrs. Boaz, you're going to be taken care of. Okay. So she does it. She goes and she uncovers his feet. Uh, and gets nice and close, and Boaz, in the middle of the night, wakes up to a pleasant surprise of a warm body curled up next to him. And he goes, huh? As you probably would, too. And, um, and again, Naomi does something gutsy. Instead of saying, yes, it's, Ru it's me, Ruth, how you doing? She says, I am Ruth, your maid. Spread your covering over me, for you are Goel. Right? That's gutsy. That's not just saying, here I am, can I join the family? It's saying, I'm already part of the family. It's time for you to step up and make this family right. It's time for you to be go well and to redeem and put this family back together the way after it has been shattered by Elimelech's death. She's not just looking for a husband. She's trying to make sure that Elimelech's name continues, that she has children and Naomi's taken care of. Again, this is gutsy. And so Boaz responds, May you be blessed of the Lord. You have shown kindness to me by coming to me and not going after younger men. True. 
And he says, do not fear, I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Two months of her taking care of, of Naomi, of Ruth taking care of Naomi, has been noticed. People are noticing that she is serious. She's not just going to walk off and, and leave Naomi high and dry. When she, the, the compliment here, to say she is a, a woman of excellence, a, a, a woman of worth, this would be, this is the feminine word for how you would describe, a feminine version of the word that you'd use to describe someone if you wanted to call them Rambo. Like, this isn't just like, you're pretty impressive, it's more like, you're gutsy. You charge. Like, you take care of the problem. You are, I, want, I don't want to fight with you. I want you on my side, right? So th this is quite the compliment. And he says to her, it is true that I am a, a Goel. However, there's a cousin that's one step closer. I got to go talk to him. You, you sleep here. You curl up. Here's, take, your take your part of the blanket. And tomorrow morning, I'll, I'm going to go talk, talk, to, talk to someone about this. So that would happen. That's what happens. The next morning, he goes to the gate. Now, the gate uh, is where everyone passes into and out of the city every day, or the town. And so that's where, if you want to do business, you grab a few people, and you, you get your witnesses, and you do it there. Like, if you want to get married now, you go to the courthouse, and you, get some, you, you can get your, every, your contract signed there. You have witnesses. That's the same way the gate functioned then. And so uh, Boaz grabs a few witnesses, and he snags the guy who is the closer Goel, the other sort of patriarch, older male in the family, the one who's one step closer related to Elimelech. He says, hey, we got, we got some business. Come on over here. And they sit down to chat, and he says, now, y'all remember Elimelech, right? His widow's back. Y'all notice that? And this other guy, the, the closer Goel, the one who's one step closer related, we never know his name, which is somewhat fitting because he turns out to be kind of a weenie. Uh, but he, Boaz looks at him and says, you're the Goel here, right? It's time for, we got to get this squared away. And the guy is excited about it. Like, what farmer is going to turn down land? Because this is an opportunity for him to buy back Elimelech's land. Farmers get excited about having more land, I'm guessing. And so he's like charging towards it. He's like, where do I sign? I get more land. Here I go. And Boaz slips one over on him. Because then he, Boaz says, before we sign, I, I got to remind you, that Naomi comes with this land, right? You gotta take care of Naomi. And, and man, Ruth, Ruth's been taking care of Naomi. This is a not very subtle dig at him because if he's the Golel, as soon as Elimelech's widow comes back from being in a foreign land, what should he have done? He should have taken care of her right away. And the fact that he didn't see that was happening and step in and take care of it. And here it is, a foreign woman has been taking care of this widow. And, and, and you haven't? Like, that's all kind of in the subtext there, right? People, they know that. And so Boaz looks at him and says, you know what, Ruth, she's been doing good. And all the witnesses are going, yeah. And, and Boaz goes, you ought to make an honest woman out of her. And the guy backpedals. It's amazing. Ruth is four chapters. Go read it. The fourth chapter. It's amazing you read how quickly the, quickly the guy goes from, yeah, more land. No, 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 no. He does not, as he says, I don't want to mess up my inheritance, which is a very polite way of saying, I don't want to have to go home and explain to my wife why I have another wife. <laughs> And, and, and the witnesses, like, they're there, to, they're providing this social pressure because he doesn't have to marry Ruth. Like, he could redeem the land and say, Ruth, good luck, take a hike. But because Ruth has been doing such an amazing job taking care of Naomi, doing what he should have been doing, the good well anyways, like, there's this pressure, you, you got to be square with this person. And so he, he runs. He's out. Sorry. It, it's amusing because the way that you hand off this, if you're not going to do it, I don't know why. It, it's an ancient tradition is you hand someone their, your shoe. And, and so I can just imagine someone going from, where do I sign? Where do I sign? Wait a minute. Let's pick you up. <laughs> so Boaz says, I'll take it. I, I will take the farm. I will buy back the farm. I will redeem the farm. And I will marry Ruth and they will be taken care of. 
And uh, at this point, the witnesses nod, they agree. And uh, Ruth, who has not had a child at 10 years being married previously, now has a child, Obed. And it's, it's interesting. Um, you just think about the, the desire for a child which is unfulfilled and unfulfilled and unfulfilled and then a child is born and, and Naomi is able, to hold, is able to hold her grandson who she but never expected to do and then Ruth's great-grandson is, is King David. And so that's part of why this story is remembered. This story has both redemption and salvation in it. Redemption is paying the price to make another person right. Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi, right? He pays the price, he does what's necessary, going above and beyond to make it right for Ruth and Naomi. That's redemption. Salvation is what happens afterwards. Salvation is a life lived after redemption. Salvation is Naomi and Ruth going from homeless and hopeless and on the edge of hunger to being full and hopeful and having land and, a pro and promise of children. Redemption is an event. Salvation is what happens afterwards. It's the continu continuing consequences of that event. And so if we wanted to say, how, does it, how do we use that language today? What I would say is, we are redeemed by Jesus 2,000 years ago. Jesus paid the price for our sins, bearing the consequences for our sins, forgiving us. We were redeemed 2,000 years ago, and the life we live in response to that, as a consequence to that, is the, is the process of being saved. Salvation is the life we live now. Right? On the front of the bulletin is this timeline. And this is how I conceive of it. If, you, if you, there's a timeline, the cross happens, then afterwards there's a little circle. And that's us, when we accept that we have been redeemed. We accept that gift. And then we join in salvation. So, redemption is a moment that we accept, and salvation is all the life that happens afterwards. And the fact that salvation is a process, it actually shows up in the language. The word for salvation and save are the same in Greek. Save as in like heal. When we talk about how the doctor saved my family member, it's the same word for salvation in, in scripture. And so when we talk about someone saving, we're talking about them saving a, a body, right? Saving some part of, of my, my father-in-law had a heart attack, and so or my, my cousin had cancer, and the doctor saved them. We're talking about something very bodily. And I think Ruth helps us remember this. Like, reach out and touch the person next to you. Just put your finger on them. Seriously, put your finger on the person next to you. Like, that body, that body is being saved. Like, salvation is not something you can let, put your finger down now, unless you want to keep on poking the other person. <laughs> But, like, salvation is not some sort of pie in the sky when you die. Salvation is this. Salvation is good news for the body, right? Jesus talks about, the, Jesus, in the, on the other side of resurrection, is a bodily resurrection. He has scars, right? You can touch him. And, and the good news of salvation is for, it is spiritual and corporeal. It is spirit and it is body. It is every part of us. And the result of, so redemption is the event. Jesus gets right with us on the cross. We get right with God. And salvation is what happens afterwards in response to that, as the good news. And so let's talk about some examples. If I want to talk to a veteran about salvation, about redemption and salvation, what does that look like? It means you can look at a vet and say, you are for, because of what Jesus did on the cross, your redemption, your salvation is that you are forgiven. I care that you get mental health care for your PTSD, and we have the promise of the kingdom of God that is to come. All right? Or salvation for a woman who's been abused. You are forgiven. We're going to help you start a new life. And there's the promise of the kingdom of God that is to come. Salvation for widows. Most women outlive their husbands. Salvation for widows. Now what does that include? Salvation for widows is you are forgiven. Here is a community that will walk with you through your grief after your husband dies and the promise of the family made right in the kingdom of God that is to come. You, you see the theme there? Redemption is a one-time event by Jesus for all. 
Salvation works out in our lives, and there are some parts that are common. Every person is forgiven. Every person is headed towards the kingdom, kingdom of God. But there are parts of that are, that are specific to the brokenness that is in our lives. Right? Salvation is for every part of our lives, and each of us are broken in different ways. To think about salvation, I often hear it discussed in too small of terms, right? I, I hear people talk about it, and I just think your understanding of salvation is too small. Salvation is every part of a person. It's good news for every part of the person in this life and in the life to come. I think we see it in the story of Ruth and Boaz when we see the way that after redemption, after Boaz has bought the family farm back, that every part of Ruth's life is different from there on out. From childless to having children, from, hungry, from being hungry to having food, from not having an extended family to being surrounded by it, there's no part of her life that would not have been transformed by this, what happened. And so church becomes the place where we hear the good news of redemption, that the price has been paid for us by Jesus, and then the church is the vehicle of salvation of people and of creation. There is nothing broken that Jesus has not died to redeem, and there's no part of our lives that Jesus doesn't offer as, to fix as part of salvation, whether it is in this life or in the life to come. If it's broken... Jesus died for it and is doing something about it. Amen.